This is Tech Talk with your host, Tom DiOria. Tom will spend the next hour making your life with technology a little easier with explanations of the different aspects of today's technology and how it can benefit your home, small office, or enterprise. Now here's your host, Tom DiOria. Welcome to IMI's Tech Talk on this uh, first Sunday of December, 2010. Happy Hanukkah to all our listeners that are celebrating uh, we're on at 5 p.m. in the New York listening area and 3 p.m. in Arizona. And today we're live from our New York offices, and we're going to be discussing social networking in a business setting uh, with one of our frequent guests, Tony Bradley. I'm Tom DiOria. I'm the CEO of Information Methods Incorporated. And together with our weekly guest, our show will help our listeners, whether a business or home technology user, make better use of all aspects of technology. Just in case you're a first-time listener, in our first segment, Tech Talk provides you the review of last week's most significant events in technology. We start with our increased coverage of New York's technology scene, and we follow this with our industry-wide report, which could contain information on conferences, announcements by vendors, new releases of software equipment, or new contract opportunities. One or more guests follow this with many aspects of business and industry. And if you wish us to consider a topic for a future show, you can email your suggestions to techtalk, that's T-E-C-H-T-A-L-K, at imi-us.com, and we'll get back to you pretty quickly. Anytime after our show introduction, please give us a call or send an email message with questions on today's topic or anything else that we might be able to help you with. You can call 277-KF. NX. That's 277-5369. And if you're outside the 602 listening area, call us toll-free at 1-866-536-1100. You can use that email address I just gave you, techtalk at imi-us.com, to send us email questions. We monitor that throughout the show, and uh, we'll try and get your questions on this week's show. If not, uh, we'll answer you during the week, and we'll bring them up uh, possibly on the net we- net- next week's show. And we're being simulcast on the web, so if you can't get to your radio, you can listen to us on KFNX's website, which is 1100kfnx.com. And if you'd like to listen to a a previous show, you can go to our website, which is imi-us.com. Click on the Tech Talk button and then the Archives button, and all our previous shows are up there for you to listen to, copy, and do whatever you like. Uh, So please call in any time during the show, and we'll try and get you on as quickly as possible. First segment's our week in review. It's an increased coverage of technology events in New York City and around the world. It's compiled by Dave Brandon and Jose Batista. And we've got a lot of stuff to cover today. Um, Just wanted to tell you, this time of the year, holiday season, you get a lot of charity requests, some because it's the end of the year and they want to do something during the holiday season, others because they know that you can get it into this year's uh, taxes, but uh, you may you may want to do a little homework before you just give. And there, there's a website that we've been using a lot called charitynavigator.org, and there's also one that we haven't used, uh, but it's been uh, pointed out to us, guidestar.org. And what they do is they can give you lots of information on thousands of uh, charitable organizations, and basically they rate them, tell you, and, and you can even see how much of what they raise goes actually into their programs, how much they spend on administration. I know that uh, Charity Navigator, um, you know, rates them by stars, so anywhere from zero to five stars, five being the best. And it's pretty interesting if you see organizations that uh, you've been donating to on a regular basis may not come very high uh, in their rating scheme, and you may have to then make a decision as to what you uh, want to do in the future. There's, there are two things that, that uh, came up this week. Uh, one that we saw in the uh, Wall Street Journal uh, about hiding, hiding online footprints. And uh, um, there's been a lot of tracking uh, data coming out uh, recently about how everybody is tracking everybody that's on the web and how much information and data they have stored and whether or not there's some way that you can opt out of this. Um, so if you want to get a heads up on that, you can go to the Tuesday, November 30th, Wall Street Journal. They have a, um, a lot of space 
given to that that information. We're going to do a show on this for you, uh, but it's pretty daunting to find out how much information uh, uh, you have online and what cookies they put on your computer and how they track not only what websites you go to, but they are even picking up, from what I understand, information about uh, how much money you make by, uh, you know, that cookie captures when you fill out a form or something. So I think that uh, it's really important that uh, you keep an eye on this. Uh, I don't know if they're going to be able to do something that's been talking about doing a like a the no call regi- registry for advertisers, they'll do a no cooking. Uh, but we're going to track that as well, and we're going to track something else that we saw in uh, a uh, New York Times article um, about when your expert is 13 or even 10. And we all know that uh, many kids out there are a little smarter than we are in terms of that. So we're going to do a show on that as well and give you some perspective from uh, those younger experts on the Internet. Uh, the Wall Street Journal also tells us that uh, David Norris wants to collect the digital equivalent of fingerprints from every computer, cell phone, and TV set uh, top box in the world. He's off to a good start. Mr. Norris startup company, Blue Kava Inc., and this is a this is a takeoff from what I was telling you we're going to do a, a show on. Uh, it just gives us a little bit more detail that uh, Dave pulled off uh, for us. He's identified 200 million devices. By the end of next year, Blue Kava says, and he's this is one of many that's doing this, expects to have cataloged 1 billion of the world's estimated 10 billion devices. Advertisers no longer want to just buy ads. They want to buy access to specific people. So Mr. Norris is building a credit bureau for devices in which every computer or cell phone will have a reputation based on its users' online behavior, shopping habits, and demographics. I don't understand how this is legal, but he plans to sell this information to advertisers willing to pay top dollar for granular data about people's interests and activities. Device fingerprinting is a powerful emerging tool in this trade. It's the next generation of online advertising. Well, that's very interesting. That's from Mr. Norris. Might seem that one's computer is pretty much like any other. Far from it. See, each and every clock setting, different fonts, different software, and many other characteristics make it unique. So every time a typical computer goes online, it broadcasts hundreds of such details as a calling card to other computers it communicates with. Tracking companies can use this data to uniquely identify computers, cell phones, and other devices and then build profiles of people who use them. So recently, fingerprinting was used mainly to prevent illegal copying of computer software or thwarting card fraud. Blue Kava's own fingerprinting technology traces its unlikely roots to an inventor who in early 1990s wanted to protect the software he used to program Keyboards for Australian pop band INXS. So uh, we're going to follow this, but uh, as I said, this is not the only company that's doing this. And the issue is going to come up as to whether or not you can protect your privacy. And not every time you go to uh, Target's uh, website to buy a jacket or something else, uh, it's going to be tracked and people are going to come uh, trying to sell you other stuff. Okay, Telegraph UK tells us that Iran has previously denied the stuck next worm, which experts say is calibrated to destroy centrifuges, had caused any damage, saying they uncovered it before it could have any effect. But President Ahmadijian said it managed to create problems for a limited number of our centrifuges. Earlier in November, U.N. inspectors found Iran's enrichment program temporarily shut down, according to a recent report by the U.N. nuclear watchdog. The extent and cause of the shutdown was not known, but uh, uh, speculation fell on that worm. And finally, The Economist tells us there is not much to see in the city of Bakerfield, north of Los Angeles, but recent events have it put on the global electricity industry map, as in many other Californian communities, Pacific Gas and Electric, PG&E, the local power utility, had installed smart meters in most households. Soon afterwards, customers started complaining about rocketing power bills. Predictably, this caused a political storm. Local politicians and consumer groups jumped on the issue. Enterprising lawyers launched a class action suit. PG&E admitted that some of the meters had technical problems, but the higher bills were clearly due to a combination of exceptionally hot weather, increased charges, and changes in the rate structure. 
independent auditor found nothing wrong with the smart meters and that California's regulators did not stop PG&E from selling more of them. But utilities and regulators elsewhere spooked by the incident have become much more careful before embracing the technology. The reasons are part technical and part institutional. Technology is a good place to start. Sensors are getting even cheaper. But for many applications, they are much too expensive. HP, for instance, likes to point out that its super-sensitive accelerometers are made in the same factories as its printer cartridges. But the firm's sensors are still too pricey to use them for anything but high-value applications such as oil exploration. This is a pretty interesting thing. I'm not sure we got uh, very far on that, but uh, we'll see if anything comes out of this, but I don't, but I don't think so. And uh, Finally, uh, Billion Dollar Day, Cyber Monday, was the biggest in history. Uh, this is from CNN. Monday lived up to a holiday season hype, becoming the biggest online shopping day in history, according to web and, uh, analyst, analytics uh, company Comscore. Just over $1 billion was estimated to have been spent online in the United States on Monday, Comscore said, making it the first Internet shopping day to cross that threshold. And on that note, we're going to take a break. We're going to get to our guest, Tony Bradley. We're going to talk to you about social networking in a business setting. This is Tom DiOria. It's IMI's Tech Talk. And we're on KFNX AM 1100. Please stay tuned. We're going to be right back after this. Welcome back to IMI's Tech Talk. It's Sunday, December 5th, 2010. I'm Tom DiOria, and we're on KFNX AM 1100. And as I mentioned to you before the break, uh, we've got Tony Bradley as our guest, and we're going to be talking about social networking in a business setting. And uh, if you're a regular listener, you know that Tony writes the network column or and blog for PC World, and he provides practical IT insight for business technologies. He is also the chief product evangelist uh, for Zircon. I probably pronounced that wrong, so he'll correct me. Uh, a leading global provider of encryption-based security solutions to protect corporate data and guard against internal security threats, uh, which has been something uh, I think that uh, if you've been listening to the news this week, that's uh, something that's been coming up a lot lately. Uh, Tony is certified as a CISSP ISSAP and has been recognized recognized as a Microsoft MVP in enterprise uh, security for the past four years. And you can uh, follow Tony's writing on PC World's network blog or follow him uh, on Twitter at Tony underscore Bradley PCW. That's B-R-A-D-L-E-Y PCW. Tony, thanks again. We really appreciate uh, you taking the time to be with us. No problem. Thanks for having me back. So let's uh, go right to the heart of things here. Um, what's your feeling about social networking, and uh, do you consider it to have uh, any legitimate place in business? Well, I think that it, I think it very definitely has a legitimate place um, in business. I mean, I think Facebook, uh, in particular, and Twitter have emerged as um, really very powerful uh, marketing tools. Um, you know, Facebook, if you, you know, look past the, uh, you know, the Farmville and the Mafia Wars, um, they've actually rolled in. You know, they, they recently announced, the, you know, some, some changes to messaging. They have uh, an alliance with Microsoft that provides access to Microsoft Office functionality from within Facebook. They have an alliance with Skype that provides sort of one-click access to, uh, you know, VoIP calling your Facebook contacts. And so if you start putting all the pieces together, um, Facebook is actually a, a, a very nice and free uh, sort of online messaging and collaboration platform. And with over half a billion users, uh, you know, members of Facebook, and Facebook having passed Google as the single destination online that users spend the most time at, um, it, it really is almost an imperative that businesses also spend time there. That's where your customers are. That's where your partners are. That's where you can interact with people. 
foot. Now, it's interesting that uh, um, just to support what you just said, that if you go to many people's websites, Facebook and Twitter, icons are all over the place. So it's it's something that I gather you've seen companies uh, starting to uh, to migrate through in a, in a big way. Well, yes, and you know, it, it 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 reminds me a little bit of the beginning of the dot com age, though, where everybody felt this this burning need to go buy a dot com, to go buy a domain, and, and set up a website, but they didn't really know what to do with it. They just felt like they should have one because that's just what everyone did. Um, and I think Facebook and Twitter are sort of like that right now. Like I think I think a lot of companies. Feel like they, they they know it's out there. They feel like they should be a part of it, um, but they're still really trying to grasp what that means and what they're supposed to do with it once they've established it. Um, you know, but but the other aspect of that is while I do feel there's a legitimate business use, um, that doesn't necessarily mean that I think all users should be granted unfettered access to social networking. Um, you know, where there's a legitimate business use is in marketing, it's in customer relations, it's in, you know, th there are various ways you can use it. Um, but when it comes to your average end user, I think it's more a matter of, you know, sort of like personal web surfing, uh, you know, and those types of things where um, you almost have to allow it because to try to ban it would be almost futile. Um, but you still want to limit it and you want to monitor it and you want to, you know, you, you have to, you have to understand that there are risks involved for uh, letting end users jump on social networks. Well, I guess we should uh, talk about that a little bit. I mean, what should companies uh, be worried about when it comes to social networking? I mean, you touched on a, on a few, but this could get out of hand, couldn't it? Well, it, it, it can. And see, you know, the problem is, you know, when you put something on a social network, it very quickly is, you know, published for the world to see. So, um, you know, it, it's a problem when you have end users who, uh, you know, maybe publish sensitive information that, about the company or, um, you know, you know, whatever kind of classified confidential details that you don't really want the world to know about. Um, and you know you have users who are who are you know putting them on Facebook status updates or sending out tweets. Um, have you seen that um, by use by going into both uh, Twitter and Facebook that um, um, productivity is is suffering at all? I know we had this big discussion when people started to get involved more and more and more with the internet. Um, do you see that being a, an issue here in terms of productivity? Um, I think it, 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 in some cases, I mean, I think it, it goes really down to the individual user, um, which is part of the reason that I've never really been in favor of sort of blanket draconian lockdowns on things. Um, I think that your employees are adults, and if you give them, you know, reasonable guidelines, um, that most users will act reasonably. Um, those who are going to abuse the system are going to abuse the system, regardless. Yeah, yeah I guess I guess you're right. Um, um, you just have to assume that as part of whatever corporate environment you have, that people understand that. I guess. Because they're going to do it anyway, and hopefully they'll do more of it at off work time than at work time. So, right. And if it's not social networking, if it's not surfing the web, you know, it's hanging out by the water cooler. I mean, whatever it is, those people who are who are going to, you know, screw off instead of doing their work are going to do that anyway. You know, that's that's a that's a personal integrity issue that has nothing to do with social networking. Yep. Yep. Um, do you feel or have you seen that uh, someone else's information being exploited by other people in the – well, I guess it doesn't have to be in the company, but just by anybody? Is that is that an issue that uh, people should be looking out for? How do you mean? 
Well, in in terms of of um, information that's on Facebook or or Twitter of one individual, do you see other people taking that information? Does does this whole social aspect of social network open other people up to exploitation more than you know whatever they're doing on the internet? Well, I, I think I guess I'm think, looking for yeah. vulnerabilities here in terms of you know Facebook and Twitter creating environments, or is this basically the same as the previous question with regard to everybody's an adult and, you know, if they're going to do that, they're going to do it anyway, whether it's Facebook or Twitter or something else? Well, you know, I think it's a case of, you know, that social networking very definitely provides a an, an easier uh, platform for distributing that information. So, you know, maybe, pr you know, prior to social networking, um, just being on the web, you know, whatever, blogging, emailing, whatever, um, those same risks were there to an extent, but not as much as, you know, like with Facebook at least, when I post my status updates, you know, I have some control and, you know, maybe maybe only my friends see it, but, you know, it, with Twitter in most cases, the tweets are just public domain. You know, once you tweet it, anybody can search it. It's just out there. The whole world can see it. Um, and And... You know, this is the, uh, is a little like sidestep from like the the company security issues of social networking. On the personal privacy and security side, you have to keep in mind that anybody could be watching, and there are there are tons of anecdotal stories of people who you know called in sick and went to the beach and got fired. You know, because they're posting status updates and and, and pictures of about all the fun they're having at the beach, and forget that you know their boss has access to their Facebook page. <laughs> Uh, you don't have to be bright to use Facebook. And on that note, uh, we're going to take a break. This is Tom DiOria. Uh, we're on KFNX AM 1100. It's IMI's Tech Talk. It's Sunday, December 5th, 2010. And we're talking to Tony Bradley about social networking in a business setting. Please stay tuned. We're going to be right back after these messages. Welcome back to IMI's Tech Talk on KFNX AM 1100. It's Sunday, December 5th, 2010, and I'm Tom Diori, and we're talking about social networking in a business setting with Tony Bradley. Tony, there's, a, there's, there's so many things that uh, we want to cover here with regard to social networking and that, how it fits into, into a business setting. Let's talk a little bit about one of the articles, I guess, uh, that you wrote about driving traffic with uh, Facebook. Uh, can you get a little bit into that, what... what uh, some people may want to do or how they can use this to their advantage? Well, that goes into, you know, Facebook um, over the past few months went into the location-based check-in business. So there were already services out there like uh, Foursquare and Gowalla that were doing this, but those are much more, you know, obscure niche services that I think, you know, are really kind of uh, – uh, confined to geeks, <laughs> more or less. But um, Facebook now is doing the same thing. So basically, I, you know, I can go with my Facebook app on my iPhone, and, you know, no matter where I go, whether I go to Starbucks or I go to a baseball game or I'm at the beach, I can check in, and it uses my GPS location and, and, and checks me in at that location. And it basically is just tying my, my actual physical location with my status update. Now, that in and of itself is, is kind of a trivial thing and, 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 and still is, is sort of in the realm of something that only techno geeks would really care about. But they tied it in with Facebook deals. So Facebook deals lets a company like Starbucks actually create like an online uh, coupon. And, and they could say something like, hey, if you, know, if you check in at this Starbucks, we'll give you, you know, a free tall coffee. Or if you check in at this Starbucks, um, you know, we'll give you a dollar off your order or whatever. And those deals are sort of pushed out to people. So, like, if, I'm, if I happen to just be walking by in the general area of a Starbucks that's offering a deal, I can see that on my phone. So that, that might actually compel me to go to Starbucks, even though I wasn't going to in the first place. I might say, well, you know, I, I didn't want a Starbucks, but, you know, they're going to give me a dollar off, so what the hell? <laughs> That's, um, that's, that's, you know, that's and, but you know, so businesses, and, and, and this is a free service, at least for now. So you can, you, you know, this is a free marketing platform. So 
a business can go out there, they can establish their Facebook place, like, you know, create their little existence on Facebook, and then they can create the Facebook deals that other users will see when they're in the general area that can help bring customers in. And that further generates word of mouth because what happens is when that person checks in to get the deal, that check-in shows up as a status update. So then their whole social network sees that they were just at Starbucks getting a coffee for a dollar off. And then they can all say, hey, you know what, I think I'll go get a coffee for a dollar off. That's interesting. I wasn't aware that it could be used in, in that way. That's pretty interesting. So is this something that's easy for a uh, a company to, to do, or is it something that they need to really be into the technology? I think it's, you know, I, I think it's relatively easy. Of course, I'm, I'm, I'm biased. It's easy for me. But I, I do think it's relatively easy um, for someone to, you know, any small business owner to kind of go in, figure out how to claim ownership of their Facebook place and how to, you know, start using the Facebook deals. And hopefully if they, you know, read my articles on, on PC World, that'll help walk them through those processes. Um, you know, so I think that there's, you know, and like I said, because it's Facebook, because everyone's already on Facebook, they already have social networks there, um, it's, it's a much more powerful tool. Even though Foursquare and Gowalla and, and Yelp are all doing a similar thing, it's not as powerful as what you have with half a billion people on Facebook. Um, one of the things that I'm interested in is the uh, security aspects of all of this. And I know that that's – and am I pronouncing it right, Zecurian? Zecurian, yes. Um, that's, one, you know, that's one of your primary focuses, uh, guarding against uh, – internal security threats. Now, do we open more doors by by uh, social networking uh, into the inner sanctums of, of our sensitive data that, that uh, uh, you know, we're trying to protect uh, from the outside world? Yes. Um, I mean, in a nutshell, yes. But it's sort of a, uh, a fact of life of today's technology because, you know, that, that concept of the, you know, we're inside the network perimeter and they're outside the network perimeter and we're going to guard everything from the outside, um, that's pretty much dead. I mean, it, it is dead um, because people have their, you know, smartphones and tablets and they're using netbooks and notebooks and they're connecting to the work VPN from the coffee shop and the hotel lobby and, you know, the users are all over the place connecting to whatever. You know, IT admins really have to figure out how to implement reasonable policies around that and then have the tools that help them monitor and, and, and control it to, to the extent that it's possible because you really can't ban it. Um, you know, it, it, it's virtually impossible because even if you, you know, say that you're not going to let me connect my, you know, you know whatever, my, my tablet or my phone to the work network, I still have it with me, and I still have, and that still gives me a connection to the outside world. And I can still, even if you totally lock down Facebook on the company network, I can still get to it from my iPhone. You know, so you, yeah. you can't really you, you can't really control my access to it entirely. So you need to have some sort of tools, and you know, like the Curian has has ZLock, which is uh, you know a product that lets you control access to USB and and whether or not someone can print things and. And it's a little bit better, and I should say it's a lot better, than other solutions where you might simply lock off the USB port. You say, you know what, we're not going to use removable thumb drives. That solution is impractical because USB thumb drives also have a place, and they're, they're, you know, they're efficient and convenient, and they help productivity. But with Z-Lock, I can assign a, a USB thumb drive to you, and I can say, Tom Dioria, this is the only USB thumb drive your computer will accept. And then I'm able to monitor what files you're putting on there, restrict the files that you're putting on there, and make sure that you're not, you know, transporting sensitive data and offloading, you know, megabytes of information to give to WikiLeaks. And that's the question I want to ask you after we take this break. <laughs> uh, this is Tom Dioria. We're live on IMI's Tech Talk on KFNX AM 1100. It's Sunday. December 5th, 2010, and we're talking to Tony Bradley uh, about social networking in a business setting, and we're going to come back, and I'm going to follow up on that about WikiLeaks, which has been in the news uh, a lot this week, and uh, see how that plays into this whole social networking. Please stay tuned. We're going to be right back after these messages.
Welcome back to IMI's Tech Talk on KFNX AM 1100. I'm Tom DiOrio. We're talking to Tony Bradley about social networking in a business setting. And if you want to follow up with uh, Tony, you can follow him on uh, Network World or PC World's Network Blog or on Twitter at Tony underscore Bradley PCW. And before the break, uh, Tony brought up a topic uh, that's been in the news lately, uh, WikiLeaks and... Uh, how do we prevent our data from becoming the net WikiLeaks headline? Well, you know, data protection has is, is sort of emerging now as this, you know, one of the one of the primary security uh, controls. I mean, you know, McAfee has data data protection tools, and Trend Micro just purchased uh, Mobile Armor so that they could incorporate, you know, better data protection tools. Um, Data protection is a, is a focus of Securian, and as I already mentioned, you know we have ZLock, and then we've got other uh, products like ZGate and ZServer that help sort of you know ZGate is a is a email gateway, uh, you know a network gateway that you know tries to make sure that your sensitive data isn't being sent out of the network. You know when it comes to something like WikiLeaks, you know I mean so you know WikiLeaks is primarily focused on. Government. I mean, they you know they make the headlines for you know exposing a bunch of classified military documents or classified uh, you know State Department uh, communications. And in a that's, recent that's today, right? Right. And, but in a recent uh, interview with Forbes magazine, um, the WikiLeaks founder uh, Julian Assange, Assange, I guess is it. I'm not yeah. sure how you pronounce his last name. Um, Assange said said that you know they're going to be moving on to corporate secrets, and that a major American bank is is the first thing on their radar. We didn't specify which one. Um, and the thing is, you know, WikiLeaks is just, they're a very high profile, prominent example of what can happen when your information gets leaked. But they're just one. So even if it's not WikiLeaks, you still have to worry about whether or not you have an employee who is maybe, you know, sharing information with one of your competitors or is going to take a bunch of sensitive data with them when they, you know, before they quit or if you, if they get fired and you need to have tools in place. Um, and, and, you know, I'll, I'll continue harping my own. You need to have tools in place like Securian, Zgate, and Zlock that help you uh, identify and restrict that activity. Let's, let's go into that in a, a little bit more detail because obviously if somebody's bent on getting the information to WikiLeaks or some other me, media outlet like that, I mean, there's little you can do uh, in terms of them putting it on a thumb drive and bringing it out of the office to their home computer. But what can uh, businesses do to protect themselves? Uh, obviously, they can they can go to a, a company uh, like yours and put into place as, as much as possible so only people that, are, that should have access have access. But uh, um, can you go through a little bit about what the uh, – the process would be that that you would try to educate these organizations because it's as we discussed at the beginning of the of the program uh, to a lot of these companies and organizations and individuals even uh, this whole thing is new so even if they go on and they figure out how to do it they could be opening up this door without even knowing they're opening up this door so what do you recommend? You know uh, the, the problem in a lot of cases is these these are it's a, it's a new attack vector. So you're used to trying to fight against this you know faceless malware developer outside of the network. And the dirty secret is that your internal authorized users are a much bigger threat. You know I, I might actually give access to sensitive data to somebody because that's part of their job. So the question is, how do I control what they do with it after I've given them access to it, um, and, or, or at least how do I monitor it? And that's, you know, again, like, for instance, with ZLock, I can at least narrow it down to, you know, you're only allowed to use the encrypted USB thumb drive that I issued you, um, and, and, and that, that's going to narrow it down to some extent. At the same time, I'm monitoring the data that's being transferred to that USB thumb drive and creating a shadow copy of it, so I have a forensic record, so, you know, a month from now, I can go back and I can say, all right, well, what exactly did Tom put on that thumb drive? And at least I'll know. You know, it's not going to help me put the genie back in the bottle, per se. You know, I can't, I can't get the data back from WikiLeaks, but at least I know what's out there. Um, you know, but I think to, it, when it comes to someone who's bent on doing that, it's really, it, is, it is hard to prevent somebody because if it's not on a USB thumb drive, you know, then, you know, maybe they email it to themselves or maybe they offload it to, you know, box.net or, you know, drop sync or something, you know, put it on a, a cloud-based storage. 
um, there are so many ways um, for that information to get out of your network that you really can't prevent them all. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's tough, and without uh, you know, I mean, you could put legal sanctions in place, but again, this is all after the fact, after it's out, which is, I guess, you want to try and protect it ahead of time. But I guess what you're saying is, there's no real way to do that. There, there, there is no hundred percent way, and that's why I think you know you need to have some user awareness about the social networking aspect, and and make sure that users understand what information shouldn't be shared on a social network. Uh, and, 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 you know, kind of educate people that way, have some policies in place around what kind of data is or is not allowed to be put on removable media. And after you've done the user awareness and you've got the policies in place, then you need to have, you know, a tool like a Z-Lock or a Z-Gate and be able to monitor those activities. And, you know, it, it, you're, you're only going to cover, you know, 95% of your bases, but um, that's, uh, you know, 95% more than most companies are doing now. Tony, let's end on a uh, high note here. We have uh, a few minutes left, and maybe you could just give us some more examples of uh, uh, using social network in various business settings. I know you gave us the one with regard to Starbucks, but can you give us some other examples that people may, you know, create some thought in people's minds? You know, again, when it comes to the, you know, the, the basically the marketing potential of, you know, something like Facebook is, you know, it gives you, it gives the, the company an opportunity to, you know, basically engage with customers at a more social level, like not just, not just marketing to them, not just, not just, you know, blasting out ad slogans or whatever, but actually communicating with them. And it, it basically fosters a sense of community and, and, and customer loyalty um, to make the user, you know, make the customer feel like they're a part of something. Um, and in the meantime, after you've built up this, this presence on Facebook, it is a, it is a marketing tool because if you've got, whether you've got a thousand followers or 10,000 followers or a hundred thousand followers, now you've got a platform where, you know, you can put out a message and all of those people will see it. And not only will those people see it, but if they share it, then you have, you know, exponential marketing capabilities because their entire social networks will then see it. So I guess it's good not only for the company, but I guess the the salespeople within the organization, if they're doing a, a similar type of thing, um, you know, their clients and potential clients are going to be able to follow them and and when there's a need, uh, pick up on it, I guess. Right. Well, and, you know, Facebook also recently introduced an ability to create your own, like, segregated groups. Now you can also use it, you know, like, let's say, you you know, you have a, a, a partner company. You can, you know, create a little mini social network just between you and that company and communicate within that group in, in, without sharing that with the rest of the world. You know, so, you know, and that goes back to what I was saying about it being a, you know, really this kind of free communications and collaborations platform that, you know, is really on par with what Google has to offer, but nobody really talks about it that way. Well, Tony, I really appreciate you taking the time to be with us. Uh, I know our listeners got a lot from this. And, uh, again, if they uh, want to follow up with you, uh, can you tell them how? Um, well, as you pointed out a couple times, you can, you know, follow on uh, Twitter at uh, Tony underscore Bradley PCW. You can also, you know, find me on Facebook, and you can uh, go to the PC World uh, network blog. Great. Thanks, Tony, and, and uh, have a great holiday. We appreciate you taking the time. You too. Take care. Next week, we're going to again be live from our New York offices with our Week in Review and our Interop coverage discussing the trends and sessions from this year's Interop New York City. I want to thank Terry Ruggiero, I'm Ice President, and Dave Brandon and Jose Batista for the Week in Review, Eric Johnson, our producer, and our executive producer, Matt Campagni. Thanks again for listening, and please don't forget to tune into Tech Talk next week at 5 p.m. in New York on KFNX AM 1100, and it's still 3 p.m. in Arizona, no daylight savings time. Remember to send us your suggestions for future shows or ask us questions by sending an email to techtalk at imi-us.com. Have a great week. Thanks again for listening, and happy Hanukkah. Thank <laughs> you.